Yes, let's legalize some marinara. They legalized the other thing, and you got uh, stupid floating around. Wow, I, I went on social media this afternoon, and the big buzz is some moron who is married that tweeted anger to Cody Rhodes because he didn't take a picture with his wife, but instead took a picture with a pretty woman. Um, I wonder how his ugly wife feels about that. Then you got some moron that sets up a petition that wants to have the Chris Benoit murder suicide case reopened thinking that Chris didn't do it. 500 people sign it and thousands online have to call these people stupid instead of just ignoring them and not giving them what they want, which is attention. And probably would took the cake today. I'm sure you all saw it. All of these reports that Ari Emanuel suckered Vince McMahon, played him, that as soon as the sale was over, Vince's powers were removed. Hmm. Let me think about that for a minute. Somebody who was almost 80 years old gets almost $10 billion for WWE. After the money changes hands, the stock drops 20%. And because Ari Emanuel in the business world explains to those with a college education that Vince's uh, power of what he could do with his stock where others have to, uh, to wait a certain amount of time People interpret that, that Ari Emanuel played Vince McMahon. If getting billions of dollars of profit, 80 years old, and not only that, still owning 16% of a company on top of that company overpaying for my company, yeah, I'll take that any day of the week. You could bitch me around. You could slap my ass. You could turn me into Susie. I could care less. That is playing Vince McMahon. Bizarro land, everybody. Bizarro. And if you saw the banner tonight, CM Punk. Look, we don't need to spe spend much time on it. It is simple. The same media, the same media that is reporting that WWE said no and opted not to sign CM Punk. Okay, let's just use common sense for a second. Majority of these media outlets reporting that, that they opted not to sign CM Punk are the same people that up until the day before WrestleMania 39 went on podcasts with over 100,000 subscribers and said, it is possible that Cody Rhodes did not sign a deal with WWE. It is possible that Cody Rhodes will not appear. Do you honestly think that these elite media with the anti-punk agenda suddenly have all of these contacts within WWE that is going to tell them that, yeah, we opted not to sign CM Punk. What the fuck does that even mean? We opted not to sign CM Was there a contract discussed? Was something proposed? Just because there's a feeler and somebody says, yeah, I would call back. Opting not to sign is a lot deeper than just saying, we don't want them. Listen to the words carefully, everyone. They simply didn't just say, WWE doesn't want them. They have to use cute words, opted not to sign. I'm telling you, the ones who are close to CM Punk's camp, and you know some of those journalists who are, take note, they are the only ones that did not say what the elite media did. So that is why if you see my banner, it is plain and simple. WWE has chosen not to sign CM Punk yet. Survivor Series, too soon. Road to WrestleMania, 
different story. We're going to get a repeat unless some major screw up happens and CM Punk shoots himself in the foot. We're going to get the same goddamn scenario that we got with Cody Rhodes before WrestleMania 39. You will have all of this junk media putting shit out there just to put it out there to get the hits and the views. And look, you saw SmackDown Friday. You saw it. We talked about it. We showed it. The stare down between Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes. Did you see what Sports Illustrated put out today? Okay. SmackDown ended Friday night at 10 p.m. So sometime between after 10 p.m. and 12 noon today, so sometime between late Friday night and 11.59 a.m. today, WWE management was contacted by Sports Illustrated, and not only did they get one person to tell them this, they got multiple people to tell them this. Why did it wait until after a Cody Rhodes, Roman Reigns stare down to get what is being reported today. Currently, there are no plans for Roman Reigns versus The Rock at WrestleMania 40. It continues on that saying that multiple sources within WWE say that this is not in The Rock's corner, that this is up to TKO Group Holdings if they want to pursue this in the future. You mean to tell me that after The Rock showed up on Pat McAfee, you mean to tell me for the last bunch of months, weeks and months, those same WWE sources were tight-lipped, but because Roman and Cody have a stare down Friday night on SmackDown, suddenly everybody's talking, the fuck out of here. You know what happened on Friday? All of the clickbait media and the ones that are desperate for ad revenue any way they can get it who have been telling you that the rock versus roman reigns is the marquee match at wrestlemania that's the match at wrestlemania cody it's it's no 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 they all realize fuck we can't say that no more fuck we got survivor series around the corner fuck we're going to have to do some bloodline and judgment day joining forces because there's not enough members for a war games match. Finn Balor, Damian Priest, Jimmy Uso, Solo Sokoa, possibly Roman Reigns, opposite side, Cody Rhodes, Jey Uso, Sami Zayn, do not discount Kevin Owens. And you could pick someone else if you want. Maybe they do four on four. They realized, shit, we can't push that anymore. Because now it's going to be obvious that if we don't report that our sources told us it ain't happening, then we're going to just look like we're liars. That's what transpired this weekend, everyone. They realized they can't say that anymore. And that's the deal. Roman Reigns versus The Rock was never discussed for WrestleMania 40 after WrestleMania 39 concluded. If you listen closely to what The Rock said at Pat McAfee, this was something discussed well over a year ago, and it wasn't in the cards. And once they went the Cody Rhodes route, and once they decided to do Dusty, Dusty is beloved not just by wrestlers and fans within WWE and beyond. You have NXT, their personal relationship. There is a very close bond about Dusty Rhodes, and they made this a love story. I know that sounds corny, but this is a one-year, year-and-a-half love story. It is going to look back as finishing the story, doing what my dad was unable to do, and this is the ultimate tribute. You do not throw that out the door. You do not flush it down the toilet because some morons out there think that WrestleMania 40 won't sell out, won't make record revenue, won't do gots if The Rock does not take on Roman Reigns. 
You got to start ignoring these people. They are just beyond stupid. It's beyond stupid at this point. Over and over and over again, this shit is happening. So forget about The Rock and Roman Reigns' WrestleMania 40. They can't use that narrative anymore. Could happen on another premium live event. We talked about that before. But WrestleMania 40, it ain't happening. Now, some big news came out today from Monday Night Raw. Playing hot potato with the WWE Tag Team Championships. How do you feel? How do you feel? Seriously. To get the Triple H with the Elmo with the fire that he is booker of the decade, booker of the century. Triple H is much better for today's day and age compared to Vince McMahon. I will admit that. But Triple H is far from perfect. I saw people with the panty waist out there with their balls in a bunch today. How could you have Johnny Gargano? Johnny Wrestling. Yeah, he loses his first match back. I am one of the biggest Johnny Gargano fans out there, and I will even admit it. He came out there tonight against Ludwig Kaiser. I thought Ludwig Kaiser in the beginning was laughing at Johnny Gargano because there was no crowd reaction whatsoever. A little bit later on, you got a polite Johnny Wrestling, Johnny Wrestling. Ludwig Kaiser is the one. You look at the promo, the specimen. He looks like an oil painting. That is the one that is getting pushed to the next level. Johnny Gargano without Tommaso Ciampa, it's not very high in the food chain. That's just the way it is. It's not anti-Johnny Gargano. I wish Johnny Gargano would get pushed more, but it ain't happening. Zia Lee today, as much as I am a fan of Zia Lee, she looked like a fool. Becky, Becky, what about me? I challenge you. What about me? Well, Zia, if you want it, you know, just, just name your time. On my terms fuck is that you want to challenge a champion in storyline you fucking grab your opportunity what is this kindergarten that you know you have a crush on someone and when they're not looking you know you're all googly eyed but when you're they're looking at you 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 turn you act like a dick i mean let's be honest you know some of the wrestlers that were brought back to tv are simply designed to fill spots of people who were released. It's just the way it is. If you accept that, then you'll have no problem with it. Natalia today, she's back to smiling. We talked about that for the last three weeks. You know, one week she's angry, total bitch, asshole, douche. And then a week later, she's smiling. Oh, Tegan, you did great. I'm rooting for you. And now today, she's smiling, hugging babies, and she's losing. And then what happens two weeks from now? You know, she's going to get pissed off again. Is she going to turn on Tegan Knox? Look at Tegan Knox. Let's look at it closely. Even though, if you remember Tegan Knox in NXT, Tegan Knox towards Lyra Valkyria on last week's NXT was more Tegan Knox than Tegan Knox has been since she's been on the main roster. But if you want to read between the lines, Tegan Knox embracing Becky Lynch, love, love. I just want an opportunity, great backstory, inspirational, coming back from injuries, family, this and that. Shows up in NXT. She is a total asshole. Lyra, you have to put your title match on hold. You got to put the title match on hold. Wait, did Tegan Knox, I mean, did Natty, did they drink from the same water fountain? And then let's use Indy Hartwell. Indy Hartwell. I mean, you remember everybody petitioning to bring it to the main roster. And as much as I like Indy Hartwell, I didn't think the timing was right because how is she going to overtake so many women on the food chain? And what happened? Two weeks ago, Indy Hartwell shows up on NXT TV and wants a shot at Becky Lynch's championship. So they do a three-way match to determine who gets the title shot for Becky Lynch. She loses, and two weeks later, she gets a title shot. I mean, if there's any consolation about tonight, as far as the women go, I think this is pretty fucking cool. Did you take note 
how many women were on Raw tonight? Chat room, just for fun, very quickly. How many WWE women, the women's roster, how many women do you think were on Monday Night Raw tonight? I might be off by one, but how many women do you think were on Raw tonight? It, it'll blow me away if somebody nails it. Um, Michael Gonzalez says nine. All right, rapido. Benjamin says 12, maybe 13. JS says 10. All right, what if I told you 17? What if I told you 17 women were on Raw tonight, not including the referee and not including Samantha Irvin? And if you want to count with me, this was one backstage segment. Nikki Cross back to being a psycho once again. So you could count all the women there. Then you could go to the women's match. We could add Natty to the mix. Then you could go to Rhea Ripley. Hold on. Rhea Ripley versus Shayna Baszler, which honestly the finish was pretty awful. Zoe Stark, instead of the referee doing everything possible to get out of the ring, he's just like standing there waiting for her like, go ahead, cause the DQ. She causes the DQ. It goes over like a wet fart. Zoe Stark could, could power slam a building right now, and the fans really would not give a shit. But... You had Raquel Rodriguez going at it with Nia Jax. You had Zoe Stark going at it with everybody. You had Shayna Baszler going at it with Rhea Ripley. Rhea Ripley trying to go at it with Nia Jax. Zoe Stark going after Rhea Ripley and Nia Jax. And then later on, we find out that's going to lead to a title match at Crown Jewel. So there are more women, but we're still not done. To quote the famous hip hop song, we're not done. We're not done. Wait. Was that Boogie Down Production? Boogie Down Productions. I can't remember. Oh, God. Oh, shit. He's right on the tip of my tongue. Props to anybody who remembers. Who, who's the rapper for Boogie Down Productions? Oh, my God. I can't believe I'm drawing a brain fart right now. Well, anyway, yeah, there's Indy Hartwell. There's Indy Hartwell. She's with Candice LeRae. We're adding people still. We're not done. We're not done. There's the Zia Lee. I want title match. Name your date. When I'm ready, KRS-One. Thank you, Kevin Milwaukee. KRS-One. Used to be a huge fan of krs -1. But look, now, yes, we already counted Rhea Ripley and Becky Lynch on that list. But we also had a little teaser. Jay Cargill and Becky Lynch. Becky being a little extra animated towards Jay Cargill. Crowd is popping big. Popping big. You understand now, you know, the WWE Universe is very, very excited to see what she can do. You do not base your level of excitement on what she did in AEW. Because when you see the, the number of women who have become major superstars in women's wrestling through the WWE, I mean, WWE would have to falter what maybe the worst in the history of women's wrestling for them, or Jay Cargill just doesn't want it enough. How you look at WWE's track record, whether you like them or not, the odds are that Jay Cargill is going to be a major star. And WWE is portraying her as a major star in the making. But like I said, even though some of the storylines today were kind of kakash, at the end of the day, you had 17 women. You didn't have a segment where there was 16 women around the ring and only one person talking. Every woman, in some way, shape, or form, got a decent amount of play. Some are going to get some opportunity. Some are not. 17. So that was what I noticed today more than anything. Um, the tag team title change, I don't like the hot potato stuff, but we're leading into Crown Jewel. And Crown Jewel is going to be really interesting because as of right now, there are five title matches set for Crown Jewel. Could be more. 
Now, I know what you're all saying to me right now. DT, what are you talking about? There's only been two matches announced, Drew McIntyre and Seth Rollins and Rhea Ripley, as we said earlier, defending the WWE Women's Championship against Raquel Rodriguez, Shayna Baszler, Zoe Stark, and Nia Jax. Fatal five-way. And as you see on the poster, they are fully clothed. So that is set for Saudi Arabia. But there is more. Yesterday on the sit-down, we talked about it. This was before it became hype, before it was pretty much now hitting the newswire. Logan Paul is making his return just in time for Crown Jewel. And this Friday on SmackDown, Logan Paul is going to challenge Rey Mysterio for the United States Championship at Crown Jewel. So that will ma that match will be set this Friday. Also this Friday, we have Roman Reigns and LA Knight. That will be made official for Crown Jewel. And if you saw today, and maybe this kind of ties into the tag team title. Let me put it this way. And you know my scenarios in the past have, have nailed it. As confusing as it may feel that Cody and Jay lost the titles today, that could be simply because Crown Jewel is coming up. Remember, they get more money for one Crown Jewel event than more than what WrestleMania generates. Let that sink in. So if you're gonna if the if the crown prince says dance, motherfucker, dance for that kind of money, you dance. You dance. You dance on your head if you have to. When you realize the amount of fundage involved, when Indus Sheer shows up tonight on Raw, Pierce, we need to talk. Who would be better suited? for Indus Sheer to face for the undisputed WWE Tag Team Championships at Crown Jewel. Jey Uso and Cody Rhodes, who are big-time babyfaces, that would take away from Indus Sheer because Indus Sheer would be hometown heroes, so, per se? Or do you have the evil Judgment Day defending the undisputed WWE Tag Team Championships at Crown Jewel? So... My vibe right now is that this tag team title change was designed to keep the heat on Jimmy Uso because remember Fastlane. Remember Fastlane. Who won the titles at Fastlane? Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso. Who was the only person that was absent in that tag team title match to cause disarray? Jimmy Uso. Do you remember the SmackDown the night before Fastlane when the Judgment Day and the Bloodline minus Roman Reigns agreed to do business together? Do you remember the stare down with Solo Sokoa and Damian Priest and Rhea Ripley talking to uh, Paul Heyman? You know, acknowledged, you know, challenge accepted, alliance made. And what happens? We go to Fastlane the next day and Jimmy Uso is out eating tacos. Do you remember? We were all confused. Like, why didn't Jimmy Uso get involved? What was the point of the day before? Well, now suddenly Jimmy Uso, I don't feel like having tacos today. I feel like costing Jay to match. They didn't have Jimmy at Fastlane because Jay and Cody won. So now they take the titles off him and suddenly Jimmy shows up. So I think tonight could very well have been designed to keep the heat on Jimmy because Jimmy versus Jay Piers will happen at Mania. I'd be shocked to shit if it happens at Crown Jewel. But if the Crown Prince wants to pay enough, no, 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 you do not wait till that's a media. This is your asset media. Jimmy and Jay, one on one. I doubt it. I don't think the crown prince gives a shit that much about the Usos. I got Uso. And I don't picture it. I think in this year gets the title shot against the judgment day. And once crown jewel is over with, we will probably get another title change back to Jay Uso and Cody Rhodes. By the way, 
as you see, for those that might be new to my channel, we don't go match by match, breakdown segment by segment on Raw. Most of you saw Raw. You know what happened. We're discussing some of the important aspects of Raw tonight. And that's why I'm here. And then we're going to also talk about a few other things. Also got ratings, and uh, that'll be interesting when you get into that later. Um, something else tonight. The... Why was Sami Zayn so upset at Jey Uso at the beginning of Raw? For those that missed Raw tonight, you know, just want to set something up. We had an opening segment on Raw where Sami Zayn was in the ring. Sami Zayn telling everyone that he is heavyweight championship material. I don't disagree with that. I think him versus Seth Rollins could happen down the line. I think him versus Drew McIntyre next week might be a preview of a title match a few months from now because I do believe Drew McIntyre is going to take that championship off of Seth Rollins. may not happen at Crown Jewel, but it will happen shortly thereafter. And then Drew McIntyre is going to need a couple of baby faces to defend that title against. And I think Sami Zayn will be back and get a title shot against Drew McIntyre. I got news for you. That will be a money match because people will be on both sides of the coin thinking that, hey, you know, this might be Sammy's shot of becoming world champion. Or Drew could start a nice little run for himself. But I was a little confused because Sammy comes out and he talks about Kevin Owens being traded. I love that he was wearing a KO shirt, which was cool, wearing his friend's shirt. That I liked. But then... We get the typical open with the judgment day come out. We want Monday night war. And they surround the ring. And Jey Uso shows up with chair. Jey Uso has Sami Zayn's back. Sammy, not happy. Sammy leaves the ring and Jey Uso's like, what the fuck? I thought we were friends. Yeet. So we learn a little bit later on that Sami Zayn tells Jey Uso, Kevin Owens should be the one to have my back tonight. And he's not here because of you. Am I an idiot? But why is Sami Zayn in storyline not angry at Cody Rhodes? Sami may have amended things with Jay later on. Look, oos, you know, I, I didn't cause. Why isn't Sami Zayn even an ounce, not angry at Cody Rhodes. Cody's the one that brought Jey Uso to Raw in storyline. Cody is the one that told the WWE Universe weeks, maybe months ago, that somebody would ultimately be traded to SmackDown. Cody was the one on, uh, on TV recently that announced that there would be a trade made. And then we found out on Friday, Kevin Owens was booked. Why wouldn't Sami Zayn be angrier at Cody? Because Cody started a chain of events that led his tag team partner to be traded to SmackDown. You know, maybe I'm nitpicking a little bit. You know, there was a couple of things that were tremendous tonight on Raw. There was a couple of things, if you really are honest with yourself, I mean... Creative wise, sloppy, maybe even mess category. But, you know, Drew McIntyre later on, you know, my only problem with Drew McIntyre is that people think, and, and let me, let me preface it like this. And, you know, our discussions are spur in a moment. I don't think about these things before him because we're doing the shows right after Raw. You remember when Jey Uso did show up on Raw? And then they did this storyline where nobody trusted him. How do we know you're not still bloodline? Were they all sleeping for those six weeks leading up to tribal combat? Were they all sleeping? when Jay kicked his brother and kicked Roman Reigns and had the tribal combat and everything else and deuces out. 
We, the, as far as the storyline goes, we're supposed to believe that Jay didn't have the tribal combat match, that he walked out of SmackDown and Cody brought him to, to Raw. And we're supposed to forget that for over two months, Jay Uso was not in the bloodline. I mean, let that sink in. So now, Drew McIntyre, we're supposed to think that after Clash at the Castle last year, that Drew McIntyre was went away. Drew McIntyre was off TV for a while, nursing some injuries, working out some details with contract, and he came back. But he didn't leave September 2nd of last year. You know, and, you know, it was September 3rd of last year. He left, you know, months after that. And it wasn't, you know, Clash at the Castle came and went, but there was none of this extreme resentment and anger and almost obsession with the bloodline causing him defeat at Clash at the Castle. He feuded with Gunther. He feuded with others. And this really was not brought up much at all. The only time it would be brought up is when an opponent would make fun of him and say, you failed the Clash of the Castle, you will fail again. So we're supposed to feel that now, a year later, Drew McIntyre was champion, yes, during the COVID era, but Drew McIntyre had a heavyweight championship for quite some time. He was the COVID champion, as I coined it. But we're supposed to feel that all this bitterness has just been seething and building and brewing over the last year. You know, it's kind of, eh. But... He's making it work, you know, but I will say this, the confrontation that he had with Seth Rollins tonight, I thought was great. I'm really looking forward to this crown jewel match because I honestly think Drew McIntyre is getting this championship again, may not happen to crown jewel may happen a short time after, but I think it's happening. And if Drew McIntyre turns full blown heel, which is he's on his way, um, He's going to be an, un, I hate to use the phrase because I know other people use it, but he's going to be an unstoppable force. But why would Seth Rollins be so angry because Drew McIntyre was seen, you know, because they were doing it. Adam Pierce was talking to Ricochet and Drew was sitting in the back of Rhea Ripley is there. Like to make a big deal about that, I think is kind of goofy to be honest with you, but that's part of what they wanted to do tonight. You know, I like how Drew talks about Seth Rollins repackaging himself 53 times. And I have a theme song that I could bring back that everybody will get into, but I don't need that as a crutch. You know, Drew McIntyre is really doing spectacular in this feud and I'm looking forward to it. And then later on, later on, Drew McIntyre, has a little confrontation in the back with Sami Zayn. And he says to Sami Zayn that he couldn't believe that he would forgive Jey Uso so easily. And Sami Zayn felt that he agreed with Seth Rollins that they needed to put the bloodline in the past. And Jay has done everything he can to make people believe in him. And Drew McIntyre is the only one who doesn't buy it. So where does this lead? Next week, these two guys are going to have a match. And slowly, Drew McIntyre has got to face Cody Rhodes in the very near future. Cody is not the be-all, end-all with this feud. If you look carefully, they are gradually building him up to beat the biggest baby faces on Raw. Xavier Woods, eh, maybe top six baby faces. Xavier Woods, Kofi Kingston, Jey Uso, Sami Zayn, Cody Rhodes, Seth Rollins. Maybe those flip-flop. But that is what they're doing. They're just very... Drew McIntyre keeps having these backstage conversations that turn into confrontations and they lead to matches. The big question is what happens next week on Raw? Does Sami Zayn get pinned? A lot of people may feel that would be a mistake right now. 
does Drew McIntyre get pinned? That would be a very dumb mistake to do. Do we have a little bit of clusterfuck, Seth Rollins of vomit, disqualification? That is a good possibility. Drew McIntyre is not joining Judgment Day. Even if the Judgment Day, you know, because if you listen closely, when Damian Priest was talking to Rhea Ripley and Dom and Finn Balor in the back, Damian Priest, you know, Rhea Ripley said to Damian Priest, forget about Drew McIntyre. You know, let's focus on getting those tag team championships back. You know, Rhea, you know, just trying to change the subject about Drew McIntyre. There's no nefarious thing going on right now. Drew McIntyre will be his, he will be a lone wolf. Not to bite off of Baron Corbin, but Drew McIntyre in the end will be a lone wolf. He will be a full-blown heel, but he is not aligning with the Judgment Day. Drew McIntyre is going to beat the balls out of Seth Rollins. We'll see what happens at Crown Jewel. But you almost feel like we have to have at least one title change at Crown Jewel. Usually something happens at Crown Jewel. Monumental. Logan Paul. A lot of people want to see. I'm surprised today how many people want to see Logan Paul win that United States championship. And the only reason why I don't agree with it is because Logan Paul isn't going to suddenly be on TV every week on SmackDown with that United States championship. What is he going to do? Turn it into a 24-7 title where he go makes media appearances holding that belt? I mean, it was very cool after his his match over the weekend wasn't even wrestling. And he says, I want Rey Mysterio. Now, 10, 20 years ago, as ridiculous as that may sound to you and I, imagine a, an MMA fighter or a boxer in their territory, in their turf, their home turf, with fans there that, you know, majority are probably not pro wrestling fans. And you just win a legitimate bout, and then you challenge someone for that fake shit. I guarantee you 20 years ago, people in an MMA crowd or a boxing crowd would laugh their ass off if somebody high profile won their boxing match and live there. You won. What are you going to do next? I'm going to challenge a wrestler for a championship. Back in the day, that would be laughed at. It would be embarrassing. People would be like, did he really just say that? I, I didn't hear that. Now it's entertainment and nobody has a problem with it, but I don't see Logan Paul being on WWE television, you know, on, on a semi-weekly basis. You know, he, this is just for crown jewel. This is simply for crown jewel. Benjamin says Logan Paul is a YouTuber, not a boxer. You challenge him to a boxing match, see how you end up. He's he's legit. He's a YouTuber who happens to box pretty damn good. I'm not a big Logan Paul fan. I'm not. Everybody thinks that I'm a big fan of everybody. I'm not a big fan of Logan Paul. I'm not. There's a lot that I don't like about Logan Paul. It's not that I want to see him get his ass kicked, but the fact that he appreciates and loves pro wrestling as much as he does, and the fact that he put in that much effort in the matches that he had from Roman Reigns to even the stuff with the Miz and everybody else, Ricochet, the, f the fact that he puts that much work in and delivers, how could you not respect that? The YouTube stuff, I could care less. I would love to take one of those million dollar Pokemon cards, tear it up and shove it up his asshole and have a little troll come out of his nostril. I'm not a fan of Pokemon. I don't, criticize anybody that does just was never anything for me but there's a lot i don't like about logan paul but the fact that he respects wrestling as much as he does that uh, that wins me over as far as him doing stuff in wrestling and you know what we could segue very quickly we could go off topic for a minute let me give you a little quick very quick this week preview of this week in wrestling history trust me if you don't like Logan Paul, you, I got an audio clip for you. And I will tell you this, this was not planned. But when you hear this person's voice, he sounds like Logan Paul. It, you'll, you'll appreciate it. But anyway, let me just show you very quickly. Believe it or not, my friends, tomorrow, 
the infamous cage match between Superfly Jimmy Snuka and the Magnificent Morocco turns 40. 40 years ago yet tomorrow, excuse me, I almost said yesterday, 40 years ago tomorrow, Jimmy Snuka and Magnificent Morocco had their cage match. And I've always said Magnificent Morocco is one of my favorites of all time. And just to this, actually, the highlights for this week with audio, I think are all promos. I want to just give you a quick sample of what it was like 40 years ago, being a New Yorker, just looking forward to seeing these two guys battle in Madison Square Garden. This is a very, very quick promo by Morocco about Jimmy Snuka. Mm. Mm. When you just get a little taste, when it just touches the tip of your tongue, when you just reach out, reach out, and you got it by the head, you know then that everything else is behind you. We have, Superfly, you and I have reached the zenith. We are the Big Apple. We are New York. We are Madison Square Garden. As much as the people love you, uh, they love to hate me. Because when I'm bad, I'm so good. I'm so good. Whew. I'm glad I said those things. I. I never said nothing. I'm glad. I'm glad you dove over the top rope. Tried to drive me through the concrete. Because we just got a little. We just put our foot on it. On my way. On my way to loneliness. On my way to solitude. Oneness. That's why I started it all, Snooker. That's why I found it all. That's why I went looking for it. They know you. Your, your reputation, your talent, your ability speaks for itself. But you weren't the man you were. You lost that spark. You lost that fire. So in front of millions of people, I came down here, spit in your face. Still didn't set fire to you. But then, but then I made you look into your soul. Then I made you think about what's going on in your own life. Look back into your roots where you really came from. And there, Superfly, there, Superfly, is where the volcano erupted. That's where you threw your 250 pounds out of the sky onto my body. That's where you came after me like you never come after anybody before. And that's where it started. Only the beginning, Superfly. Because one of us, only one of us will find the solitude that we deserve. The greatness that only stands alone for one, for one at the very top. Yeah, this episode, I actually, there's more promos. Uh, somebody asks if they're on YouTube. No, not, not all of them are on YouTube. Some are my own private collection. So I know there's other podcasters that like to play like clips and stuff like We've been doing that for years and years and years. I'm going to skip over the confrontation between Sherry Martell and Medusa. This was a match that was supposed to happen 30 years ago, this week in ECW, 1993, they actually recorded a promo going after each other in a hotel room. The match never happened. Medusa never wrestled for ECW. But that was legendary at the time. 
if I played this promo, you have Sherry Martel accusing Medusa of uh, some very interesting sexual things. In fact, I think Sherry Martel admits that she had sex with Greg the Hammer Valentine and others. It's wild, but we're not going to play that today. Instead, I, I'm going to show something else for you. Um, this week in wrestling history, yes, we have Medusa. Bang, 316. Vince just wet his pants. Do you know that segment was 30 minutes long? We can't even highlight it tonight. That's how long that segment was. Uh, Sabu, this week in history, 30 years ago, got a tryout match with the WWF, took on Owen Hart. Hayabusa, you'll have to tune in for news about that. Uh, Bam Bam Bigelow, ECW. Look, Brock Lesnar, Undertaker. This week in history is when Ric Flair busted himself open. Umaga destroys Steve-O. One of my favorite moments ever. Yesterday we talked about it. Vince and Stephanie going at it in the ring. A little Jericho. A little Rock. There's so many other things. But this week in wrestling history, we also had the debut of this guy. This guy made his debut. Anyone remember Kevin Federline? Anybody remember the confrontation with him and John Cena? Does anybody remember who brought Kevin Federline, K-Fed, to the WWE? It was Johnny Nitro, who you see on AEW now. Is What is he now? Johnny, uh, what is he? He was Johnny Impact, Johnny TNT. No, is he Johnny TNT? Well, uh, Somebody will re remind me. He's Johnny something, John Morrison, and Melina. And this is a quick highlight of what went down with K-Fed. Tell me he doesn't sound like Logan Paul. He sounds just like Logan Paul. I want to say thank you to Johnny right? and Melina. Tell me he doesn't sound exactly like Logan Paul. Even his pitch and his cadence. It's real good to be here. Come on, people. Actually, it ain't so good to be here. Thank you, Johnny Elite. That was his name. That's his name right now in AEW. Johnny Elite. Thank you. Brain fart here. You people need to stop booing. Nitro and Melina and start treating them and me with some respect. There you go. Sounds you know, just that. like Don't listen Logan to him, Paul. Man. These people are ignorant. These man, people are ignorant, okay. man. It's okay. The same people that are in here booing are the same people that are out buying magazines with my face in it every week. You all know it. You know, I think you're just a bunch of L.A. superficial posers. <laughs> oh, snap. Wait a minute. That's right. Oh, my God. Kevin. Now that, that was so profound. You know, Kevin, since you're out here, why don't you do us the honor and debut a new song off of your new album? All right. Come on, please. Yeah, come on. Come on. No, do it. Y'all want to hear me rap? Yeah, yeah come on, let's hear it. Yeah. Y'all want to hear me rap? Yeah. Don't you, JR? Well, uh. Y'all want to hear me rap? You can wait. Halloween, oh. pick the album up. Oh, and guess what? We already heard it. <laughs> hey, yo, yo, Melina, K-Fed, let's get the hell up on out of here, yo. Let's go. Let's do it. Here comes Cena. Cena. All right, you all know Cena's music, so we can fast forward that, but I'll give you a little sample of Cena from that night. Brings back memories. 15 years ago. Promise some sort of elaborate hip-hop performance and then waltz out? What are you doing, man? I don't... 
I don't care how you feel about these people, man, but that's just wrong. I don't want to get them cheated. But I can understand your album's out October 31st, so... You know what? I ain't done this in a long time. Hold on. I want to say thank long you time. to Johnny... And I may be a little bit rusty. Nowhere near the quality or performance of a Kevin Federline, but uh, maybe tonight is the night that the old veteran dusts off the mic hand. The album's called Playing With Fire. Hold on. I got a better line. Let's call it the world's biggest scumbag. What? Here he is, Kevin Federline. The only reason people know you is because your fame and fortune's built in. He's, he's got like John Cena street cred and less talent than Paris Hilton. It gets really good really quickly, I promise you, if you never heard it. You wanna, you wanna knock on these people? K-Fed, you must be dreaming. You see, they hang with a Marine. You're with a dude who likes semen. Oh, you, you mad, Johnny Nitro? You ain't got the nuts to hit me. And if K-Fed wasn't around, I'd be spearing Britney. Oh, wow. That was right. All right. You can tune into This Week in Wrestling History for a shitload more, like three hours of retro. Um, and you know what? Just to piss off the Vince McMahon haters out there, uh, this week in history, Vince McMahon had a lot of press for donating, I think, over a million dollars for uh, law enforcement and for people helping September 11th. You see um, that article there. That's something I pulled out of uh, one of my own newspapers. So, Oh, you know, there is one more. There is one more. Does anybody remember Stand Up for WWE? Do you remember this? I'm sure you probably don't. But for those on video, look at your screen. And these were the 10 things that WWE wanted you to do. What was this, like 10 years ago or so? And, you know, this was when Linda McMahon was running for office. But this is about WWE and how it's portrayed online. When you hear Vince's plea to the fans out there, tell me this could this would not still be relevant in 2023. I'll put it on the screen, and then I will hit you with a little audio. This is quick, but it's it's kind of comical. The United States senatorial campaign in Connecticut involving my wife, former WWE CEO Linda McMahon, and Attorney General Richard Blumenthal has quite frankly put the spotlight on WWE and has resulted in some negative and inaccurate attacks on our company. So we're reaching out directly to you, the WWE universe, our fans to provide the real facts about WWE. And we ask you to join us in responding to these malicious attacks against the company and you, our viewers. We've initiated a new campaign called Stand Up for WWE. We'll be posting videos regularly on WWE.com to set the record straight. And we ask you to utilize YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, as well as WWE.com to correct biased and inaccurate media reports. We encourage you to sign on to WWE's Facebook page and upload your videos, your pictures, and your stories on YouTube voicing your support for WWE. Let's show the world the power of world wrestling entertainment. Let's stand up for WWE. Thank you. 
You know what I remember the most from that? Some people got very, very weird about their fandomhood for WWE, and they were not being recognized or acknowledged, and people started making threats. Very, very weird at that time. Um, I, I, You know, we covered it. So I got to go back to the old DTKC shows. And uh, you know what? Actually, speaking of DTKC show, here's a quick plug. Next Tuesday, Kev Castle and yours truly will be doing a special episode. Now, I don't think we are going to be doing cr uh, Crown Jewel predictions unless he is around maybe next Wednesday because the Tuesday after is, ho is Halloween. So maybe on November 1st, maybe we'll do predictions for uh, Crown Jewel. But next Tuesday, Kevin and I are going to be doing a special episode, so you can mark that out on your calendar. So this week in wrestling history, I promise you, if you tune into it, you're going to get a lot of good stuff. A lot of stuff, I mean, there's just too much that I could put for today. Anyway, just to wrap up Raw with a couple other things, um, I got to tell you, as you saw on my synopsis for today's show, play on words, Gunther and Bronson Reed delivered big, as in big Bronson Reed. I think this is the turning point for Bronson Reed as far as the fans go. The fans were into this match. I was into this match. Gunther shows once again why he is arguably the number one wrestler in WWE. He might not be the, the number one character and the number one moneymaker and the number one ratings generator or ticket seller, but as far as performance goes, he could wrestle a dead person right now and make it look good. Bronson Reed, though, that is not a knock on Bronson Reed. Bronson Reed delivered tonight. You could feel it that this was arguably Bronson Reed's biggest match of his career. He's wrestled high-profile matches overseas. He's wrestled matches high-profile in the past. But this one hit different. And the fans acknowledged it. We got an awesome chant during this. Bronson Reed, Gunther, you know, look, Gunther is a heel. You know, the ring is sacred. But it even felt like Gunther showed a little sign of respect to Bronson Reed after the match was over. Spectacular match. Uh, look, there was no chance of Bronson Reed getting this, but when he hit the superplex and then went up for the tsunami for a brief moment, some people thought, holy shit, would they dare have Bronson Reed be the heir apparent? Gunther got out, of, you know, jumped off. Unfortunately, no water in the pool. Gunther gets out of Dodge. Gunther, you know, hits his own splash, gets a two count. He had the power bomb, Bronson Reed, which that in itself is a huge feat. Power bomb Bronson Reed and got the win. They gave it enough time. I mean, I got to be honest with you. I enjoyed this match more than the match he had with Ciampa. Gables was more emotional. This match, to me, turned the corner for Bronson Reed. A lot of people do like Bronson Reed, but the WWE Universe has not had that connection. And I think that's more because Bronson Reed, his character is a little confusing at the times. At times, remember when he first came in, he was aligned with Miz. And then remember the whole Dexter Loomis thing with the money bag and all that other shit. And then I'm my own person. And it, it just it felt, then he was a bully. And then he was just more about, you know, for himself. His character's been all over the place. He's actually one where he doesn't have to talk much. And the crowd is still digging what he's doing. Plus, when you have that size and you're as agile as he is, listen, when he was in an NXT, you know, I know he wore the colors one night. But a lot of people felt at times the Bam Bam Bigelow vibes because Bam Bam Bigelow, God rest his soul, was so goddamn agile for somebody that size. And trust me, there was many times when I was hanging out with Bam Bam Bigelow personally. And the guy is a lot bigger, even when you're in person. And look at me, I'm 6'3", 
And at the time, I was probably, what, 285? And he was just that much bigger. And you just say to yourself, I can't even reach down to pick up a piece of paper, you know, and Bam Bam Bigelow's doing cartwheels and all that, even towards the latter part of his career before he passed away. You know, Bronson Reed delivered big tonight. Gunther, he brings it every night. Bronson Reed, they had a great match tonight. If you did not see it, it's worth a watch. Um, it it really showed. And and again, we got Elimination Chamber a lot quicker than you realize it's going to be. And Bronson Reed's going to have a very big role on that show. They don't want it to feel like a crown jewel, a Saudi Arabia event. What I mean by that is, in this year, most likely is going to get a shot at the tag titles at crown jewel. Or they're going to get a high-profile match at minimum. Problem is, once Crown Jewel is over with, what are you going to do with them? You know, we we had that appearance by Shanky, you know, in India, and he did good. And next thing you know, he was released. But before India, he was doing much nothing. After India, he was doing much nothing. And then he got released. I'm not saying that India Sheer will be released, but they have done nothing with them recently. And what happens after Crown Jewel is over with? With Bronson Reed, though, when they announce a high-profile match for him at Elimination Chamber, whether it's a title shot, whether it's Seth or Drew or anybody else, or he gets a spot in the chamber, they want people to feel that Bronson Reed earned whatever match he gets there, not being put in there simply because they're going to be in Australia. That's the difference. And he did a great job. All right. Um, yeah, no, Austin, I agree. Shanky never really did it for me. I mean, the dancing stuff, like he was kind of likable, you know, lighthearted, but it was, I just never felt it. It felt forced. It felt like they want me to dance, so I'm going to dance. You know, it didn't feel like, uh, you know, it was just, you want to see, you want to feel authenticity. And yes, everybody plays a character when they're on TV. But it, it sometimes it has to feel like it's an extension of the person. And nothing about Shanky felt that way. Um, as we said earlier, Rhea Ripley took on Shayna Baszler. She wins by DQ. Zoe Stark, you know, again, hits the ring. She's in the corner. The ref is just looking at her like a clown. And instead of just trying to get her out of the ring, she hits Rhea Ripley, causes a DQ. Everything gets in disarray. That leads to the five, uh, fatal five-way at Crown Jewel. Piper Nevin beat Natty. After the match was over, uh, Piper Nevin and Chelsea Green were trying to attack Natty. Again, if you look at Piper Nevin closely, I like her. But if you look at the beat down the Natty after it looked like a bad cartoon. She did it again where it looks like she's having some type of, I'm not trying to be funny, and I'm sorry for anybody that deals with this. She looks like she's having some type of a seizure with her arms. Like Natty, after the match is over, you, you want to feel like she's legitimately getting her ass kicked so Tegan Knox makes the save. But Piper Nevin is like this, you know, like, like she's swimming. You know, like it just like her arms are flailing, like she's got no strength in them, and it looks awful on TV. It doesn't even look intimidating. You know, like it it almost looks like a bad episode of the Three Stooges. Like you almost want to go, nya, 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 nya. go back and watch it, and tell me if I'm exaggerating. I'm not. It looks like a bad episode of the Three Stooges when she does that. Kick her. Do a splash. She's just standing there, just flannel, flannel in her arms. Like she's, I don't know, flagging down an ice cream truck. But again, 17 women that I counted on WWE TV today. That's fucking big. And I know a lot of people aren't even going to realize that 17. And it didn't just feel like, ah, right, throw her out there. Just let her make an appearance. You know, felt more than that. Uh, also, um, next week, Alpha Academy is going to take on the New Day. That'll be a fun match. Next week, we have Drew McIntyre and uh, Sami Zayn, which will be interesting. Where this goes with the Judgment Day, like I said, 
it feels a lot more about Crown Jewel than anything else. Um, what are the matches did they schedule for next week? Because I feel like I'm forgetting one. I think there was another match set for next week. But as far as other match results, am I leaving anybody out? I don't think I am. Um, no. Oh, I am leaving one out. <laughs> How could I forget this? All we have to do is just see this spot. I mean, look at that. Shooting star off the fucking second tier. Ricochet and Shinsuke Nakamura. We knew that Nakamura was getting this win. You know, the segue to, to Ricochet was to quickly get you to forget about that he just lost two very big matches with Seth Rollins. Shinsuke Nakamura, it was never let's elevate him to main event status. I think he has earned it well before the matches with Seth Rollins, but they needed to sell it enough where, you know, he was a viable opponent for Seth Rollins. And there was a decent number of people that thought Nakamura was going to win that championship. It was not never in the cards. It was not in the cards, never in the cards. And Ricochet attacking Shinsuke forces Shinsuke away from Seth Rollins because Ricochet's not even going to allow Shinsuke a moment to breathe. He's going to be there to cause him nothing but problems. Will they have a match at Crown Jewel? I don't think so, especially when you realize right now we're up to five title matches expected. LA Knight, Roman Reigns, the women's fatal five-way, Drew and Seth Rollins, uh, the tag team title match, Rey Mysterio, Logan Paul. That's five title matches. And you got to also think about Brock Lesnar. We had that conversation yesterday. Brock Lesnar does not miss crown jewel events. Doesn't mean that Brock Lesnar has to appear on WWE television before crown jewel. He could, but they could just announce that Brock Lesnar will be there. I personally would not do it as a surprise. I would announce beforehand. I would, if I'm living in Saudi Arabia and as, as much as they freaking are into Brock Lesnar, I mean, you, you let that audience know beforehand that Brock is going to be in attendance. So, as of right now, no title match for Gunther. And, you know, I brought this up at least a half a dozen times over the last six months. If you pay close attention, Gunther does not appear on that many premium, as many premium live events as you think. Gunther has a lot of TV title matches. But if you look at some premium live events, you look back at some, not all, but a decent number, it's more than you think. Gunther does not appear. Now, I don't know if there's something where he doesn't want to compete in Saudi Arabia. I don't want to say that. I'm not even inclining that. But, you know, as of right now, we haven't heard anything about Gunther. I hope Gunther is there. I absolutely would love. I'd want to see Gunther versus Brock Lesnar in Saudi Arabia. I'll even take Gunther versus Bronson Reed versus Brock Lesnar in Saudi Arabia. That was the match we were talking about yesterday. So we will see. I mean, we're only two more Raws before Crown Jewel. So next week is Raw, and then the week after is the go-home to Crown Jewel. So if shit's going to go down, it's going to go down quickly. Um, And as I said earlier, Johnny Gargano lost his match to Ludwig Kaiser. Giovanni Vinci got involved a little bit. Early on, it looked like it was going to backfire. But ultimately, towards the end, after Johnny Gargano hit the one final beat, Vinci raked his eyes and was actually inside the ring for a few moments. Referee did nothing. He ran across the ring. That took the distraction, put the distraction on him. Johnny Gargano took his eye off the ball. Ludwig Kaiser hit the end of Gurry and won the match. Then later on, Gunther meets up with Vinci and Kaiser in the back, and they're cheering Gunther for his victory. And Gunther, you know, gives props to Kaiser, but then puts down Vinci. You did not accomplish what you were supposed to do. And Vinci's like, what are you talking about? I helped Ludwig Kaiser win the match. But Gunther said that he saw 
Johnny Gargano walking around in the back. So I guess Vinci was supposed to take out Gargano where he can't even walk. But it appears, even though they didn't clearly say it in the promo, but it looks like Vinci is going to take on Johnny Gargano next week. Now, honestly, what I would do is Kaiser tries to cause interference to help Vinci win. And this time around, Ciampa shows up. Ciampa helps Gargano by neutralizing Kaiser. Gargano gets the win over Vinci, and that just sets uh, Gunther off big time. I still believe that Giovanni Vinci is going to get kicked out of Imperium. In fact, I got something else for you. Somebody who I am friendly with in WWE that I was talking to earlier today said to me that they're working on new music for Ludwig Kaiser. So Ludwig Kaiser will be getting his own entrance theme very, very soon. Don't know when exactly, but they are working on a new entrance theme for Ludwig Kaiser. So take that as news if you want. You know, I throw things on here for all you. You know, I don't do it to get attention elsewhere. But, uh, but overall, you know, Raw tonight, not too bad. Can't complain overall. The title change at the very end, you know, has a lot of questions to it. But with Saudi Arabia and then Survivor Series not too far away, you kind of feel where this is going. I just don't want to see hot potato with that championship. You know, there are a lot of other tag teams. And listen, we talked about it over the weekend. WWE has split up a decent number of tag teams as well. And, you know, if, you, if you're if you going to play hot potato, just to add angst between the Judgment Day and the Bloodline and, you know, Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso and Sami Zayn and whoever else you want to put in that mix. In fact, I just thought of something. Here's an idea. Here's an idea. Drew McIntyre loses to Seth Rollins at Crown Jewel. And then we start from pushing towards Survivor Series war games. And then you have Finn Balor, Damian Priest, Jey Uso, uh, excuse me, Jimmy Uso, Solo Sokoa. And then on the opposite side, I think you should add a fifth man, to be honest with you. I think you go Roman Reigns. And then on the opposite side, you have Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, even though he's on SmackDown, which is fine. Remember, Judgment Day. Now, since the Judgment Day have the tag belts, now they could go back to SmackDown. Cody and Jey Uso have to remain on Raw. So you could have on the opposite side, Jey Uso, Cody Rhodes, Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn. Who's the fifth partner? You could go LA Knight, or you could go Drew McIntyre, and then Drew McIntyre stabs his team in the back. The only reason why I don't think that'll happen is because war games, you can't leave. You can't escape. It's not like a regular tag match where Drew McIntyre could just walk off the apron and walk to the back and just leave his partners out to dry. If they don't do war games, then I could see that happening. If they do war games, I think LA Knight could be that fifth partner. And I think that's how they could go with it. So we will see what happens. All right. Uh, two main event matches tonight, if I remember correctly. Uh, Chad Gable beat Trick Williams, and Akira Tozawa beat Nathan Frazier. Those were your main event matches. I didn't write it down, but those were the results. I remember now. Those are definitely the results. All right. Um, before we jet out of here, we're at 78 minutes. Uh, tomorrow, Patreon, if you want to check it out, I'll be live. It'll be off the cuff, so everybody that's a Patreon will definitely put input. Don't forget this Thursday, I'm going to record the next Q&A. Go to the community section on YouTube if you want to post a question for me to answer. It could be about anything. I'm cool with it. Let's talk briefly. Oh, you know what? Let's briefly talk about NXT. Tomorrow night, we have Baron Corbin versus Carmelo Hayes versus Dijak. Whoever wins gets a title shot against Ilya Dragunov. Should be interesting. 
because a lot of people think that Baron Corbin will be getting the win out of this. I know that kind of sounds like the last person that should be winning it, but that is very possible tomorrow. Tomorrow we have Tegan Knox versus Lyra Valkaria, and let's see how Tegan Knox reacts when she loses. Let's see if we have interference, maybe. Also, tomorrow, the bada-bing, bada-boom, the battle royal, and uh, Tony D'Angelo and Stax will be overseeing the bada-bing, bada-boom, battle royal. On AEW's part, is it just me, or does it just feel like the last couple of weeks they don't put the previews out on time as much. When they do sometimes, it feels like they rushed it. Is it just me? Or does that banner just look really depressing? You have Penta versus Jay White, Kenny Omega versus Kyle Fletcher. They're going to do another segment on Tony Storm. Jim Ross, oh, we'll get back to that, is going to interview Nick Wayne and his mother. And then they're going to do the Dirty Dozen, the Dynamite Dozen Battle Royale. And the winner of that takes on MJF for the ring. He has won that ring, kept that ring for four years now. So, uh, but, you know, the Nick Wayne thing, I'm not trying to be a jerk. I had to get a close-up of this banner. Honestly, I'd rather go sit on my toilet with sandpaper lined instead of tissues than watch this. Why am I missing something here? Like, why are we seeing this? I just, I don't get it. So, I, I mean, we know why, because a lot of what we see on TV is to please themselves and we're supposed to like it. It's like if you're a kid, your mother and your father, or your mother and your mother, or your father, or your father, or your mother and uh, the neighbor next door, whoever you want to put in the dinner table, you sit down, ma, I don't like squid. I don't like Brussels sprouts, but it's their favorite food. Like, shut up and eat it. You'll like it. That's what this kind of feels like sometimes. You know, I'm just being honest. I'm just, I see that, and it's like, I'm not really, like, interested all right, let's get into some ratings, and let's call it off. I'm looking at my notes. I can't help but to look at the Zia Lee stuff again. Becky, Becky, what happened to me? You give Indy title shot. What happened to me? Well, Zaya, just name your place. Name your date and time, and we'll do it. Uh, when I, on my terms, walks away. I know she was told to say that. Please. Someone someone always says that to me. DT, you know she was told to say that. I know. That's what makes it frustrating. It makes her look like an idiot. All right. Raw last week. Very quietly. It went from 1.2. And people are like, oh, AEW Dynamite's gonna overtake Raw soon. They're now up to 1,557,000 against football. So not too bad. Last week, the high point of Raw, by the way, the week before it was 1,5511. So it went up 46,000, not a big increase, but still going up. And strategic TV deal pending with whom we don't know. The high point of last week's Raw was Seth Rollins, Drew McIntyre, Damian Priest, the opening of Raw that did 1,756,000. And by the way, a close second was the in-ring interview with Michael Cole, Jey Uso and Cody Rhodes, when Michael Cole was trying to, like, get Cody, uh, you know, what happened to the story? You know, like, are you afraid to face Roman? You know, and then he got interrupted. That did 1,744,000. So it came very close to being the top of the night as well. Last week, the low point, believe it or not, was the main event. Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso versus Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn that did 1,333,000. And here's a little tidbit. That match went two quarters. The second quarter only went up 65,000 viewers. Also, last week, that's why I think this is a turning point for Bronson Reed. We've talked about Bronson Reed's extremely low numbers on Raw. Last week's Raw against Chad Gable, Bronson Reed's match 
with Gable and Ricochet, the three-way to determine who faces Gunther, they lost 250,000 viewers during that match. Soon as that match was over, it was Drew McIntyre versus J.D. McDonough. They got back 160,000 of those viewers. A quarter of a million fans said, we're going to change the channel. And once the match was over, 160,000 of them tuned back in. That tells you something. NXT last week. We're not going to do a whole dive. We did that Saturday. But just quick overview. NXT last week did 921 up from the week prior is 857. The high point for NXT last week was the Cody Rhodes opening, the confrontation with Dominic Mysterio, Ilya Dragunov, which led to the match and the announcement that LA Knight would be the referee. That did 992,000 viewers. Also, Dominic versus Ilya had the second highest rating of the night as far as match goes, tied with The Undertaker, uh, or came very, very close. The Undertaker did 959, so Dominic actually did better than The Undertaker. Kid you not. But then again, Undertaker showed up two hours after. So, The low point last week, unfortunately, it's the same people we bring up every single week. Tyler Bate, Brawling Brutes versus Gallus that did 861. Still not bad. 861 is the low, not bad. But here's a little more concerning. How many times have we brought up Carmelo Hayes drawing some pretty crappy numbers and even Braun Breaker at times drawing some pretty crappy numbers? That match with John Cena and Paul Heyman in their corners did 865. That was the second lowest of the night. Just something to think about. AEW last week did 609,000 viewers down from the week prior is 800,000. The high point for last week's Dynamite, just like NXT, was the opening. Christian's promo and the first half of Brian Danielson versus Swerve Strickland, that did 731,000 viewers. But a little tidbit, as that match went on, because that match went on across two quarters, they lost 70,000 viewers almost. It went from 731 down to 656 as that match went on. So they started to lose viewers. The low point of last week's AEW, the second half of Jay White and Hangman Page and the anti-Semitic angle with Bullet Club Gold. That did 548,000 viewers. And as we talked about over the weekend, for the remaining 45 minutes of Dynamite, not including the overrun, they only regained... 10,000 viewers. The last 45 minutes of Dynamite from the low of the anti-Semitic angle, they only got back 10,000 viewers. And remember the most disturbing ratings tidbit that no one is going to talk about except for us. When NXT, this is something to think about, when NXT went off the air, they had 959,000 fans watching Undertaker chokeslam Braun Breaker. AEW was still on the air for another six minutes. When NXT went off the air with 959,000 viewers, how many of those 959,000 viewers said, let me tune over to AEW and watch the rest of Adam Copeland and Luchasaurus? You know how many of those 959,000 viewers? 17. 17,000 viewers. Very interesting. New Japan on the 12th of October did 51,000 viewers up from the week prize, 44,000 impact this past Thursday did 104 down from the week prize, 110 rampage this past Friday did 407,000 viewers shit on my other notes. I actually wrote the highs and the lows for SmackDown and rampage. I forgot to bring it in the room. I do remember the quarters though. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but the high point for Rampage on Friday was Isaiah Cassidy and the Hardys taking on Daniel Garcia in 2.0. The low point for Rampage was Emi Sakura versus Sky Blue. And then we had, what the hell did we have after that? Um, was Emi Sakura and Sky Blue. 
And I don't remember what immediately followed, but that was the low quarter for Rampage. On the SmackDown side, the opening quarter, which was John Cena, Roman Reigns, and LA Knight, if I remember correctly, I think it did like 2,639,000. I don't have the exact number in front of me, but that was the high quarter for SmackDown. The low point was uh, Bailey taking on Zelina Vega and then Carlito getting attacked by the Street Profits. The number wasn't bad. It was like 2 million two to 2 million three, but that was the low point for SmackDown. And then Collision for October 14th, we'll have that rating tomorrow. The week prior, they did 353, which was up from the week prior's 327. The high point was Adam Copeland, Luchasaurus, Nick Wayne, and Darby Allen, 418,000 viewers. So if you want to be Tony Khan asshole-like, you could say that Adam Copeland never wrestled for a televised wrestling show that did under 500,000 viewers. They did 418. The low point from Collision the week prior was Juice Robinson and the Guns versus Angelico, Grand Metallic, and Gravity. It only did 286,000 viewers. And I think we got to start asking the question, are AEW fans getting tired of Lucha? And I'm being dead serious here. Like, unless you're El Gil del Vicenio, where you almost kill yourself a hundred times during a match, we see repeatedly a lot of these high flyers that just do spots are repeatedly the lowest ratings on AEW programming. We saw it repeatedly with the Action Andretti's, with the Angelico's, and, and even at times, I think we even had the Lucha Bros recently for one show, Low Points. I see repeatedly a lot of this high-flying stuff, you know, I think just maybe people are numb to it. If everybody does crazy dives and nobody does crazy dives, you know? All right, so that's it. We are at 90 minutes. I'm going to jet out of here. So I hope you enjoyed this post-Raw show. Very interesting matches leading into Crown Jewel. This Friday, Charlotte Flair gets her title match against Io Sky. Not too much uproar, maybe because Nick Aldis announced the match. I really enjoyed Nick Aldis last week. The line of the night shakes hands with Dominic Mysterio. I'm a big fan of your dad. That, that was great. That was great. Dominic Mysterio was there simply because he is the one that gets under people's skin the most. And if Nick Aldis throws a nice digger to him and Kevin Owens with a little stunner as well, all is good in the world. So I hope you enjoyed this little recap tonight. We'll see what happens with Jay Cargill in the very near future. I like that they keep, keep putting her out there. It's not overdone, but I will say this. A month from now, you probably got to pull back a little bit. I don't think she'll be a crown jewel. I don't expect that to happen. There's no need for her to be in a crowd or even come out. This that's we don't we're not at that point yet. But uh this this Friday we will definitely have uh, a little bit more progress with Crown Jewel and they'll make that match official with Rey Mysterio Logan Paul and We'll see what else develops. Now, as far as watch parties this week, um, I am going to do a watch party tomorrow for NXT because, you know, that has been really, really popular. A lot of you keep showing up. Last week, we had an insanely great turnout because we watched NXT and AEW at the same time. Um, somebody asked me, when are they going head-to-head -head again? I think it's happened in December. Somebody sent me a DM last week and said, oh, you're going to do it again when they go head to head. I don't know what show is going up with what. I don't know if it's NXT and Dynamite or maybe it's Rampage and SmackDown. Who knows? But apparently there's going to be another head to head and we will definitely do a dual watch party again. But uh, everyone, I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. 
And if you're part of our Patreon family, you're welcome to join me tomorrow night live, patreon.com slash Don Tony. If you're not, if you're a YouTube channel member, you will get that episode online as we always do. It's only fair. I mean, if they get exclusive content from YouTube, you know, they you should get some exclusive content from there. So uh, we spread the love around a little bit. And then uh, Wednesday, we'll do a little Wednesday Night Dynamite. Let's see what the ratings are for both shows this week. NXT is pretty much, ex I think NXT drops back down to the sixes. You know, I know that there's other matches scheduled tomorrow. I know Jakara Jackson is no longer in the women's tournament, the breakout tournament, but, you know, nothing really stands out tomorrow where I think you're going to see, I think it's going to drop back into the sixes. And that's really the area that NXT is usually in. Um, yeah, I'm expecting a lot of these wackos online to laugh at NXT. Oh, they lost one third of their ratings. I expect that to happen. AEW, let's see how they rebound this week. Let's see if they make any professional apology for the anti-Semitic angle. Let's see if they double down on it. Um, I personally think the fact that they waited, we're now at seven days, and no public apology or even something. And please do not tell me MJF statement. We talked about that over the weekend. But the um, fact that this many days went by tells me they're not going to. Because if you truly made a mistake and you feel bad about it and you're sorry, you issue the apology immediately. You don't let it simmer for seven days. Because then when you do it seven days later, people feel like, oh, you're doing it because the backlash continues and it's carrying over to the shows. Then people do it, feel like you're doing it just for damage control instead of having genuine resentment for doing that. So shout out to Rojo Bear, 32 months as a made man of the family. That is awesome. Over two and a half years. I can't believe we've been doing this that long with video. But I hope everybody has a wonderful night. Thank you, Guardian and Austin, for always holding down the ship here. And you all be well. All the best. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a podcaster. For me to live any other way was nuts. To me, those goody good people who work shitty jobs for bum paychecks and took the subway to work every day and worried about their bills were dead. I mean, they were suckers. They had no balls. If I wanted something, I just took it. I ran everything. I paid the bills. I paid the hosts. I even paid the masked maniac. Everybody had their hands out. Everything was for the taking. We always called each other good fellas. You would always hear from somebody. You're gonna like Don Tony. He's all right. He's a good fella. He's one of us. But if you're part of my crew, Nobody ever tells you they're going to get rid of you. It doesn't happen that way. There weren't any arguments or curses like in the movies. See, your haters come with smiles. They come as your friends, the people who've claimed they care the most for your life. And now, now that's all over. And that's the best part. Today everything is different. There's lots of action. I don't have to wait around for everything like everyone else. Oh, I didn't get the vaccine? Fuck you, vaccine me. Oh, your delivery guy has COVID? Fuck you, feed me. Right after I moved here, I ordered egg noodles and ketchup, and I got spaghetti with meat sauce. I'm no longer an average nobody, while they get to live the rest of their lives like a bunch of schnooks.